Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and good evening to everyone. I am Dr. Rezal Aziz, your master of ceremony for today. First of all, on behalf of University of Malaya, I would like to say thank you for your participation in this inaugural lecture, which will be delivered by my mentor and friend, Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani from Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine. For your information, this inaugural lecture is organized for professors in University of Malaya to share their knowledge and thoughts in their respective expertise. This lecture highlights the finest part of many interests in their field. <clears throat> to ensure the lecture runs smoothly, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping rules before we begin. As we are all aware, on the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we are required to follow the standard operating procedure, SOP, as shown on the slides in front. I would appreciate if everyone could stand up when I announce the arrival of Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, who will also be carrying the lecture and arrival of Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani kindly remain standing for the national anthem and University of Malaya song. As a support and respect for Professor Dr. April Kamila Ruslani, I would like to get everyone's cooperation to remain in the auditorium until the end of the lecture. I would also like to remind everyone to switch off the mobile phone and please set to silent mode to avoid interference during the lecture. Your cooperation is highly appreciated and thank you. Now I would like to show a short video clip regarding an emergency SOP. This is an emergency response protocol briefing. Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya places high priority on your safety and health. Please pay attention to the information that will be presented as the following procedures to be taken for this event. If the alarm bell sounds, or an emergency alert is given by the staff, please remain calm and exit according to the emergency door located in this room quickly and orderly to the emergency assembly point. Please assist pregnant mothers, children, disabled persons, and elders to evacuate at the same time. Do not use the elevator. Use the stairs instead. Please obey and give full cooperation to the staff. You are required to be at the emergency assembly point until further instruction is given. Thank you for your attention.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I get your attention, please? Please rise. <coughs> Announcing the arrival of Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, together with Professor Dr. April Kamila Ruslani, Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Thank you. Please be seated. Indah berbalam si awan petang berarak di celah pepohon ara. Pemanis kalam selamat datang. Awal bismillah pembuka bicara. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and good evening. Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman, the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Her Excellency, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Dato Dato, distinguished guests, Professor Dr. April Kamila Ruslani, Management of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. April Kamila Ruslani, entitled Training the Modern Surgeon, Lesson Learned from Professional Athlete. Without further delay, I would like to invite Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman to chair the lecture and introduce Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani. May I welcome Professor Dato Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the first inaugural lecture for the faculty for this year, pre and post COVID. So um, you, you're very, uh, uh, very honored, uh, April, to, to kick off the, this year's uh, inaugural lecture. Actually, this morning I was at a, um, a dean's and VC's meeting, and that dope Professor Harith. Um, actually asked the VC or asked us uh, at the meeting what we we're going to do about the gender imbalance at the University of Malaya. And he's, of course, referring to the fact that there are now more female academics, and he was worried that there are more female students um, at the university. So I sort of quietly said to him, it's about time, Prof. Harris. Um, and so today, I think we are celebrating the uh, one of our illustrious uh, lady academic uh, leaders in Professor April uh, Roslani. At the faculty itself, apart from myself, we have uh, Professor Young, Professor Masna as the deputy deans, and Professor Nazira as the deputy director, along with Professor Aizura. And of course, in the um, in the audience, we welcome back Tansri Rafia Salim our one and only female um, vice chancellor for University of Malaya. And listening on uh, YouTube, and the reason why we were a little bit late, um, is Professor Tansri Sharifah Hapsa, Professor Emeritus Tansri Sharifah Hapsa, um, also uh, uh, vice chancellor, of, female vice chancellor of UKM. And of course, we have uh, Prof. Roos as the master of the Academy of Medicine. So we're not short of... Uh, of female leaders at, at UM. Give us give us a big clap like that. <laughs> because after how many, after five decades, uh, we're finally here. I'm not usually a feminist, but today I am. Um, not a strong feminist anyway. So uh, as all of you know, uh, Professor Dr. April Roslani is currently the head of uh, Department of Surgery. She graduated with honors from the University of Wales in 1995 and received the Master of Surgery from uh, here, University of Malaya, in 2003. She then went on to complete the uh, colorectal surgical training with, uh, with uh, NUS and UHS in Singapore in 2007, and since then has been developing the field of colorectal surgery at uh, UMMC. As head of surgery, she's been uh, overseeing the training development in many surgical disciplines, and I can tell you that she is also uh, spearheading a, a very difficult project, the uh, National Postgraduate Training Curriculum for the Specialty of Surgery, bringing together all the surgeons um, from across all the universities who are providing the Masters in Surgery program, Masters of Medicine in Surgery program, as well as the um, uh, Ministry of Health uh, surgeons. This is um, a labor of love, literally, because, you know, as you all know, the surgeons are extremely busy. All of us are extremely busy. But um, uh, in, in uh, bringing this uh, forward, April ha has done a, a very, very commendable job. And we hope to be able to launch it uh, next year. Aside from her duties here at UM and nationally, she's also currently the president of the Asia-Pacific Federation of Colo Proctology, President of the College of Surgeons Academy of Medicine, and Vice President of the Malaysian Society of Colorectal Surgeons, and an honorary fellow of numerous international surgical colleges. A passionate educator and trainer, she organizes or evaluates numerous courses, workshops, and examinations at national and international level. So over to you, April. Professor Adiba, Chair of this session, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with me here today on this afternoon. I know many of you have had to rearrange your schedules to make it here today, but it is a very, very special moment for me, and I'm so happy that you were 
able to come here and, and share in this occasion. What I've chosen to speak on today is something that has occupied my life, my days, my nights, my every waking moment, and sometimes my dreams uh, over the past um, more than 10 years, I would say. And that is how to train the modern surgeon. And I hope to take you on this journey with me. Um, please bear with me if it goes on a little bit. It is probably my entire uh, working life that is trying to be encapsulated in this talk. The word surgery comes from the Greek words chire and also ergon, which literally is translated as handwork. And that is the hallmark of all surgeons in what they do, uh, work with their hands to manipulate the human body in order to effect a cure or healing. But really, the practice of surgery in that definition um, dates back even longer than when the Greeks first put a name to it. In the Stone Age, um, 6500 BC, we already have evidence from excavation sites that trephination was being practiced. And uh, the evidence suggests that these patients actually survive such operations. So imagine with a little more than crude instruments, no antibiotics, no blood transfusions, they were still able to do this and patients would survive. If we look at actual texts that describe surgery, the earliest one we think is from the 1600 BC. And this is a very special papyrus that actually documents the practice of surgery in Egypt. Throughout the ages, surgery has been closely intertwined with sports uh, and also war. What they both have in common is trauma. Okay, so on the left, you will see Galen who probably was the first um, formal practitioner of sports surgery. He was the surgeon to gladiators. And uh, his claim to fame in this arena was that where his predecessor had lost 60 gladiators in five years, Galen only lost four. So he was remarkable. On the right, you will see Tuo Hua, and he was a famous um, Chinese uh, surgeon. And his claim to fame was that he saved many a battlefield general from their wounds. You know? And so he was doing abdominal surgery. Again, I, I find it hard to fathom how these patients survived without um, the resources that we have now. But he was able to do abdominal surgery, resect bowel, you know, and, and even suture bowel together with the patients surviving. When you look at surgery for non-trauma, um, I think one of the seminal works was by this very famous Persian polymath. Uh, we know him as Ibn Sina, um, and the Western world knows him as Avicenna. Okay, so in his work, he wrote chapters on surgery, anesthesia, and it is thought that he was probably the first person to successfully perform a cholecystectomy. Again, without anesthesia, um, you know, as we know it today, without blood transfusions. To professionalize the um, surgical field, we go to, um, this is Guy de Choliac. He was a French surgeon. And what set him apart was, whereas the other surgeons of the day were actually little more than barbers who did procedures, you know, without any real formal training, Guy de Choliac was actually educated, um, and he was very well liked by the Pope and ended up being a physician to the Pope. So there you go, a surgeon being the physician to the Pope because he was so well thought of. And his um, legacy was the chirurgic gear magna, um, which was a tome that documented all the um, accepted practices for surgery and was used for many, many decades, if not centuries, um, to direct surgical practice. But still, he was an exception to the rule. Most surgery practice in, in his time was actually done by um, the barbers. And so what we recognize as a profession of surgery today did not really occur until the 1500s, when by a royal charter from King Henry VIII, there was then 
ultimately a separation between the barbers and the surgeons. And this is why for the non-surgeons in the audience, surgeons are still called Mr. or Miss rather than Doctor. But obviously, there have been many changes to the surgical milieu. Not only are the procedures now increasingly more technical and more, more complex, work patterns have changed, training requirements have changed, the expectations of society have changed. No longer is it acceptable for us to perform a brutal amputation without anesthesia, without probably informed consent, um, without any patient confidentiality. And even when anesthesia became available um, in the 1800s, um, this would still not be acceptable today because there is absolutely no asepsis, there's no use of antibiotics, and definitely there's no patient confidentiality either. And for those who, don't, who think that it is only skill that is essential, if you think about it, this, these pictures depict the death of Hang Jebat. And uh, you know, as a child, um, I always thought that he was, he was killed by Hang Tua and he died straight away, probably from exsanguination. But the reality is that he took four days to die. And what did he die of? He died of sepsis, okay? And this is why it's important for us to have asepsis and to have the um, use of antibiotics in our armamentarium. Instruments in those days were crude, okay? And these are instruments that are in the Sala uh, San Marco uh, Biblioteca in Venice. Uh, you will see a recognizable jiggly saw there, so the surgeons will know what that is. And it doesn't look very different to what we use today, okay? But that's not to say that our um, surgical instruments have not undergone any evolution, because now, increasingly, we have to deal with um, complex um, technologies and instruments. So you see here robotics has come into the fray, um, increasingly more minimal um, invasive surgery, and the use of augmented reality. And this is something that we have to recognize and train the next generation to be able to uh, use and de develop further. So we are now in the 21st century. What does it mean, actually, to be a surgeon? From what I've said before, it seems that being a surgeon is mainly about the technical, okay? Being able to perform surgery, being able to handle the tissues, uh, being able to reconstruct the tissues. But is that enough in this day and age? In this day and age, the expectations from society and from the profession itself are more than you being a technician because technical expertise alone weakens your legitimacy in the eyes of the public. And what you need to be performing is meaningful work. And this is not always described in the um, procedural guidelines or the professional guidelines. So to me, surgical professionalism is really about encompassing all these factors, being knowledgeable, knowing your field, technical excellence, because without technical excellence, you cannot perform the surgery safely. But increasingly, it's recognized that your professional behaviors are what is going to determine the outcome of your patients. So how do we train such a person? To start with, you have to know what the purpose of your training program is. You then need to construct a structure that will be able to deliver such purpose. And then you need to validate it and show that your training program has actually produced surgeons that are fit for purpose. Now, in Malaysia, prior to the 1980s, training was unstructured. It was pretty much dependent on an apprenticeship. So if you are lucky, um, you found a surgeon who was willing to train you, okay? And you basically, um, you lived or died by that surgeon's word, okay? There was no formal training of the trainers, and essentially your experience as a surgeon was what qualified you to be a trainer. For assessments, there was no formal documentation of formative assessment, although clearly that was going on, and summative assessments were restricted to surgical examinations. In those days, it would have been the uh, FRCS examinations run by the UK colleges. But whether the curriculum was uh, apparent 
whether it was relevant and comprehensive enough, whether the content actually tested higher order thinking, whether it was fair, whether the examiners were behaving appropriately, standard setting, whether it was done, all of these things were not actually formally described. Okay? And furthermore, in Malaysia at the time, there was no specialist registry, and therefore there was no way of keeping track for who actually had credentialed and was being privileged to perform surgery. So clearly a change needed to happen. And I want to thank um, Dato Yusuf, who was our head of general surgical services in the country. He was meant to be here and had actually arrived, but was called back to his hospital to perform an emergency procedure. And that is literally the life of a surgeon. We can plan, um, but we are not the ones who are controlling um, what happens. So anyway, he has given me this slide, and this shows that even though time has elapsed and we have been training and training and training, um, if you look at the surgical services in the country, you can see that it is still uh, unevenly distributed throughout the country. And this has implications for delivery of services, but also for delivery of training. Okay, We are still limited today by the number of trainers and by the number of acceptable training hospitals. Okay, But what we have been able to do is, since the 1980s, we have established a more structured form of training, which is the Master of Surgery. This began in the early 1980s, uh, starting with UKM, closely followed by UM and USM. And today, we have um, additional uh, members within the Conjoint Committee of Surgery, which was formed in 2007. So right now in the country, we're able to train at any one time about 200 surgeons. But the intake per year still remains around 50 to 60. And given that the surgeon to population ratio is in the region of about one per 100,000, I'm talking about general surgeons here, that is still far too few. Um, because if we aim for developed country status, we need to be aiming for something like four to 10 per 100,000. So we are far short of this. Also, despite the fact that the structured nature of the program means that the completion rate for the Master of Surgery is high, so it's in excess of 95%. The reality is that only about half of them are able to complete the training course on time. Okay, So many of them require more than the stipulated four years to actually reach the standard of competency that we feel is acceptable to practice independently. So this, in addition to the increasing subspecialization of general surgery, means that in order for you to train and, and, and finish up as a consultant in your subspecialty of interest can sometimes take as long as 26 years. And by that time, you know, there is very limited uh, uh, active practicing time for you to be able to give back um, to the specialty, to the country. Okay, and this is something that we really, really have to look into. Okay. So why did I choose to look at athletics to see if we could find some answers there? Well, there are many parallels. Both athletes as well as surgeons perform complex tasks. We have to undergo rigorous training. The hours are incredibly long. It's a high pressure environment. You have to perform under sometimes um, exigent circumstances we have relatively short careers, if you actually take the timeline from when you qualify as a, as a surgeon. Um, there's a great emphasis on teamwork, because even in individual sports, you usually have a whole team behind you, not just of other sports persons, but you know, nutritionists, physiotherapists, and, and so on and so forth. You need to have incredibly strong self-belief, OK? And sometimes that self-belief can veer into arrogance. Okay? But without self-belief, you will not be able to take a knife to a human you know, and have faith that you'll be able to get them off the table alive. So self-belief. And also what I've realized increasingly is that we have to travel a lot. 
whether it's during your training or whether it's in the delivery of your service, you have to be willing to travel. And this is not something that um, we can really argue against. What differs though between surgery and um, athletics is that failure of performance in athletics is not going to kill someone, okay? It's not going to result in disasters for others, for the spectators, etc. But for surgery, if you make a mistake, the potential is that your patient will lose their life, okay? And in that respect, we have more parallels with the military and with aviation. And it's because of this narrow margin of error that there is this need for hierarchy. There is this need for a clear chain of command. The communications are incredibly high stakes. And you see on the photo on the right is a fighter jet attempting to land on a battleship. The space for that is extremely small. The margin of error is extremely small. If you miss, you crash, you explode, you kill everybody on the battleship as well as on the, on the fighter jet. So the communications that occur in order to make that happen have to be short, sharp, and succinct, okay? We need to respond rapidly, especially to emergencies. And I think what is not always known by the public is that we have to place service to others above self. And that maybe seems contradictory to, you know, the self-confidence and the self-belief or arrogance, you know, whatever you want to call it. But that really is the hallmark of a surgeon, placing service to others above self. So who would want to do this? How are we going to convince the current generation that this is something worthwhile to do? You know, the next slide is, is, is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, it's unsurprising that if you look at the surgical specialties, they're all up here at the upper um, uh, limit of the crazy axis. But the reality is that we do what we do because we love it, because we love the sense of satisfaction uh, of getting a patient well. We love working with our hands. We love the camaraderie that comes from working with a team. And this is why we do it. So in common with, with, with sports, um, we need to inspire the next generation. Now with sports, it's easy because success is very visible, okay? Um, any child in primary school, if you were to ask them, um, you know, who their sporting heroes are, they would be able to say whether or not they, they want to play that sport. And you see here some of, some of our um, ath athletes who have excelled on the world stage. But surgeons being doctors, that's obviously not something that we can do. We can't really go and advertise ourselves. Um, and, and so really, your exposure to surgery or to surgeons is probably only after you enter medical school. And, and to me, I think that's probably a little bit late. Who are my inspirations? Well, my grandfather was an inspector of schools. And he was a strict disciplinarian, if I am to believe my uncles and aunties. But post-retirement, he was incredibly generous with his grandchildren. He always had the time of day for us. And I will always remember him uh, for the generosity that he had um, with his time. Some of his um, strictness rubbed off on his son, my father. And that's him here. Some of you may not know that he's actually an alumnus of um, University of Malaya. I, I think he was a third or fourth batch to graduate from University of Malaya. But what I learned from him was an incredible work ethic and again, service to others, uh, regardless of any uh, institutional boundaries. And you can see that although he was an alumnus of UM, he then went on to found the Department of Pathology in UKM, subsequently becoming the Deputy Dean, and then eventually went on to found the medical school in USM. So from him, I have allegiances to all the universities or the major universities in the country. And I think that's where uh, some of my desire to unite surgical training in the country comes from. 
I also, growing up, was um, exposed to very strong women. Um, and you can see there that, that um, we have a Court of Appeals judge who's sitting in the audience now. We have a former dean of the law faculty in University of Malaya who has sadly passed on. And we had matrons, we had scientists, you know, and every time we would have family gatherings, I remember being expected to have a point of view and be able to defend that point of view. So for that, if, if some of you are wondering why I am the way I am, that's why, okay, we grew up in this environment. My mother was a nurse and uh, from her, um, I gained an appreciation of the arts. Uh, I also had the, the, the travel bug because uh, she trained in the UK in Salisbury. Uh, and during that time, she traveled all around Europe. But eventually, um, country called her home. And interestingly enough, she ended up working in 7U. OK? Strange but true. And that was where she met my father, who was a medical student at the time. Okay, and uh, to cut a long story short, they eventually got married, and uh, not long after, I was born. And this was actually just before the start of the May 13th racial riots. Uh, it was a difficult time, and um, I, I remember mom telling me that she was never sure when dad went off to work whether he would come home. Okay, so it was a difficult time, but we got through that. And I ended up going to kindergarten at Tiny Tots. And I tell you this because actually my first teacher there was actually my grandmother. Um, so it's a bit difficult for you to be naughty in school because you know that it's going to go straight back to your parents, you know, that you've done something you shouldn't have. But it was a fun time as well there. There were other inspirations that were more directly related to medicine and surgery. And the faces that I've put up here are really just a drop in the ocean of people who have made a difference. Um, I put this up mainly to say to the trainers out there, don't think that any interaction you have with the trainees, no matter how insignificant you think it is, don't think that it does not have an impact. Many of these faces, it's not as if I worked with them for months or years on end. Sometimes the interaction was just for a few minutes. Sometimes it was just for an hour or so. But it made a big difference. So I'm going to direct your attention to the top left corner. Um, these were the JPA scholars uh, in 1989. Okay, We just landed that morning uh, in London. And out of that group, three of us had been identified to uh, enter medical school in Cardiff. If I tell you that all three of us ended up doing surgical specialties, and not just surgical specialties, we ended up in academic surgery, um, it's probably worthwhile just seeing what was the exposure uh, that we had there that made this uh, happen. And so I'm going to direct you to this gentleman here. He's um, David Webster, and he was the dean of the medical school, who happened to also be a surgeon, which is quite unusual in those days. And next to him is Malcolm Wheeler, very famous endocrine surgeon. But what both of these two taught me, interestingly enough, was not about technical skill. They taught me about how to deal with the patient. They taught me about communication with patients, how to get the information that you need out of the patient, how to treat the patient holistically. And, and if you think back that this is in the 1980s, before that really was in the general discussions internationally, that was something quite different. This gentleman down here, um, Pete Winterburn, was my supervisor for my um, biochemistry thesis. And that was something else that they did, which we have not yet gotten around to doing, although I think there have been discussions about it that we want to encourage that research mindset. And part of what allowed us to do that was we were able to intercalate. So you took a year out and you did a, a research project. Mine was on um, was, was medical biochemistry. And we, we looked at things like oligosaccharides and see whether it could be used in a sort of ELISA fashion. Um, so we were allowed to do that. And if you graduated, you then were conferred a BSc. 
Okay. So that was my work with Pete Winterburn. But the other thing I would say is that these two, Professor Lever and Professor Finlay, they were anatomy professors. The anatomy department was extremely strong. Um, and I remember many, many afternoons in the formalin fumed halls dissecting cadavers. And this is something that we don't do anymore. But I can tell you that that actual experience of dissecting over two years, the same cadaver, layer by layer, and learning your anatomy that way is far superior than anything else uh, that you can do if you intend to be a surgeon. Okay? So all the others um, have impacted me in some way. Um, we have the colorectal fraternity here, and I have to give a shout out to, to Charles Sung, who I think is listening in. Um, Charles, you changed my life. Um, and I think I, I owe you a great debt of gratitude, and I hope I have done you uh, proud in some way. And the others are also colorectal surgeons here. Um, we had, when I entered the master's program, head of surgery was Professor Al Jeffrey, and he's sitting in the audience today. Um, Prof, you had quite a reputation, um, but I always found you kind, and uh, I think there were occasions when your words have actually helped me get through what were sometimes difficult situations. Uh, Prof Ong is here. Um, uh, he taught me professionalism. He taught me precision in, in performing surgery. And then, of course, all my colleagues who have had leadership roles either in the college uh, or at national level. The last shout out I have to say is for this lady here, who is Prof Yip Cheng Ha. Um, and you will notice in this picture that she's the only woman. That was, that was how it was then. The first time I actually met a female surgeon was when I met Yip Cheng Ha. Okay? And it's not to say that you need to be able to see, to be able to become, but it is certainly a lot more difficult. There is a saying in Malay um, that to bend the bamboo, begin at its shoot, okay? And I think this is something I believe very strongly. Certainly in athletics, they start young. Ms. Boon Siddiq started training seriously at the age of seven. He was trained by his father who and his brothers all subsequently followed him uh, into professional badminton. I'm very cr proud to call this young woman an alumnus of UM. Pandalela Rinong. By the age of seven, she was actually a state diver already. And Farah Ann Abdul Hadi, she started training in gymnastics age three. Okay, why do you need to do this? Because you need to achieve mastery of your skills before you hit your physical peak in order for you to excel. And if you think about what we do, we are also mastering skills and we're also having to do that hopefully before we hit the peak so that we can give back um, uh, in, in a reasonably long length of time. So growing up in my family, excellence was not exceptional. It was expected. It was the norm. My father was not only a pathologist, but he was also a keen badminton player and has the trophies and medals to show for it. So it was quite an interesting household. We would spend our afternoons in the pathology and anatomy labs even the pets got into it at the end, you know, reading Snell just in their free time. And uh, we were experienced travelers by the time we were five. We had to, of course, excel at sports and dance and music. Uh, I know Dad thought that music lessons were a bit of a waste of time, but honestly, Dad, it, it's made a difference because it's developed my psychomotor skills. Okay, and there were many other things that perhaps um, our parents didn't quite understand, you know, us spending so much time on. Uh, around about the 1980s was when all these um, uh, digital games came about, Space Invaders, that taught me hand-eye coordination. Ultima 1 taught me cognitive decision-making. Um, sports, of course, was gross motor coordination and physical fitness. And then the Girl Guides was professional behaviors. And debating taught me not only communication skills, but research skills, as well as presentation skills. So everything 
is connected. Everything is worthwhile. Okay, and I think that message goes out to the parents in the audience. Don't tell your, your children that it's a waste of time. So when you start young, you need to, of course, identify talent. Um, and in sports, of course, there's you, you have professional scouts who go around to amateur events to try and pick up talent. And what we've done, and this is together with my colleague Hanafia in, in, in UKM, is we established this National Basic Surgical Skills Competition for medical students. So we put the applicants through a few rounds of, of training, etc., so that they at least learn uh, the basic skills. And then uh, we select the best to go into a finals um, uh, competition. And you'll see that it's not all directly surgical related. So we have some test of coordination here with, uh, with golf. And um, this is precision. It helps if you put a, you know, a hated target there because then you see all the darts actually hit right in the face, right in the eye, okay? Um, but, but we find that this is actually a good, good way of um, not only identifying those who are uh, potentially gifted, um, but also just to create awareness amongst medical students that, hey, this is, this is a specialty that is um, uh, quite nice to get into. But you also need to identify problems. As I've shown you before on the map, the, the, there are vast areas of underserved populations and people who are sent um, to these hospitals for training can sometimes feel very, very isolated. So over the past year, uh, together with the college, um, we've embarked on a national roadshow where we've actually gone to these isolated areas to try and understand what the problems they have with respect to training, but also with respect to actually delivery of services. So you will see here some um, of those visits. This was uh, quite a memorable visit to a longhouse uh, in Bintulu, uh, together with RCS Edinburgh president, um, past president at the time, Mike Lavelle Jones. Um, and we have a few more here uh, in Tawau, Sandakan, uh, in Miri as well, uh, as well as places in Peninsula Malaysia. And it, I think it's helpful to speak to the younger generation to find out what their fears and their worries are with regards to training. Traditionally, um, the acquisition of surgical skill was through repetition, and this is true for sports as well as in, in surgery. Um, but we face problems here because of the lack of volume, because of the limited number of trainers, and because there is some natural variation between um, trainees. And so this is what we call the learning curve. And what you can see in this diagram is that there can be marked differences in the length of time it's taken to overcome the learning curve. And this becomes even more so pronounced uh, when the surgeries become very, very technical. So as a craft-based specialty, um, we need to be competency-based. Uh, and we need to take into account also the need for rotational requirements, uh, for perhaps using virtual platforms to shorten the learning curve and other novel education uh, methods. And so although none of us wanted the pandemic, pandemic to happen, uh, the silver lining in that cloud was that actually it forced us to try and you know, evaluate these novel methods to see if we could use them for uh, surgical training. So we're gonna talk about uh, virtual platforms and there are a plethora of them out there, okay? What you choose will depend on the purpose, the group size that you wish to uh, teach, the tools, um, whether it's secure or not, and also the cost. Um, and we certainly used it um, in our practice for activities like uh, multidisciplinary team discussions, for case-based discussions. Um, and uh, the issue we had with using platforms like Zoom was security. And so there are more secure platforms like Circles MD. On top of that, we're now starting to explore telemedicine. And Dr. Encore is one of those um, companies that can provide this service. And I believe we are looking at that. So that's something that we have to also incorporate into our training of, of surgeons, the use of um, telemedicine. But are these methods of training valid? That's the other thing that you, you need to consider. Um, when we started um, embarking on case-based discussions by virtual platforms, um, we also decided to assess in some way whether knowledge transfer did actually take place. 
And so this is work done with uh, Kung Jun Kit, um, Ng Kun Yong, and also Charles Xiao Hui, uh, where we actually um, gave the trainees pre and post test questions. Um, and they were delivered in a limited time frame because we actually wanted to assess what they knew. And what you can see is that the pre and post tests um, almost universally were significantly different. So you can definitely say that there has been um, transfer of knowledge. The other thing that the pandemic uh, made apparent or made us force us to do um, was to minimize the um, attendance or the participants uh, in the ward round. And this clearly is not good for training. So what we think of now is whether we can conduct virtual ward rounds. So you will still have to have um, at least one person um, conducting the ward round. And this is what you see here. The trainee is um, wearing, um, a, a, this is something like a HoloLens. Uh, and basically, whatever the trainee sees can be seen by the consultant uh, through their mobile phone. OK, so that way they can see the patients, they can see uh, the scans, etc. cetera. Um, and this might be a way for you to conduct a ward round um, with you know, 10, 20 medical students or surgical trainees without exposing the patients to risk of disease transmission. So virtual is all well and good, and it has its advantages, but there are definitely disadvantages in terms of it. It actually takes away the interactive aspect of, of our day-to-day -day work, uh, and it can lead to social isolation as well as loss of control. Um, and of course, it also needs very good internet access because the bandwidth required is, is, is quite large. And finally, we really do not know what the legal framework for this is uh, with respect to um, exposure of uh, patient details. So we move on from the cognitive to the psychomotor. And for basic skills, obviously the stakes are lower, and so it's quite easy for us to craft, um, you know, fairly basic uh, surgical skills, surgical skills simulators. And this is something that was done by our pediatric surgery group during the during the pandemic. Okay, uh, and it, and it works fine for for basic things like suturing and knotting. But when you start going towards uh, um, more complicated instruments um, such as energy devices or staplers, you know, it's in insufficient for us to just use those sorts of simulators. And what we do now is we use um, uh, animal tissue, okay, so that it provides some semblance of uh, fidelity to, to human tissue. Um, this is a science of tissue management course that we run, and this is in collaboration with uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, with whom the College of Surgeons signed an MOU uh, and recently renewed it last year. And I think this is going to be the way forward with shrinking budgets. Uh, it's going to be essential that we form smart partnerships with the industry while still maintaining the integrity of the whole process. What about procedure simulation? And here is a 3D printed skull. This is work again done by our neurosurgeons. And you can see that it's, it's quite a good simulation and it allows um, trainees to practice craniotomies. Um, we also have um, simulators like this symbionics, which allows you to perform uh, simulated laparoscopic surgery. But you can see that the optics and the haptics are not quite as high fidelity as we would want to have. And this is why we still rely on things like animal workshops and cadaveric workshops. But once you're over that sort of um, learning curve for learning the steps of the operation, how do you show um, that you have achieved um, higher levels of competence? And that requires proctoring. Okay, I have a picture here of Professor Ismail Sagap, you know, who who travels the length and breadth of the country to try and impart laparoscopic colorectal skills. And this is also um, a workshop that I've done for um, anorectal procedures. And it's something that cannot, that there isn't really a real substitute for it, that you do need the surgeon, the experienced surgeon next to you to try and minimize 
um, the mistakes that might be made and to safeguard the safety of the patient. What about assessments? So when we look at the Miller's Pyramid, uh, basically our uh, conventional examination methods really only test competence, but they don't actually assess performance. And this is where we are increasingly moving into workplace-based assessments. Okay, and we've started implementing that to, to some degree. The way that you can simulate uh, can vary in terms of the fidelity, but it's clear that this needs to be done um, in as objective a manner as possible. And I want to just draw your attention to this touch surgery system, which actually breaks down videos um, that the trainees have perform or procedures that the trainees have performed and actually analyzes each one for a certain specific set of outcomes, thereby generating QSM scores for each of them. And this provides a really objective measure of improvement if done over a course of time. There are other ways to improve surgical performance, such as uh, intraoperative uh, 3D modeling, which, which allows you to identify complex anatomical structures, and also uh, augmented reality, um, such as with the use of, of ICG. So that's all to do with the cognitive and uh, psychomotor aspects. What about the affective aspects of training? And as I mentioned before, you know, teamwork and communication is imperative in surgery. Uh, where in battle um, or in aviation, either a miscommunication on the left here, you see um, the friendly fire incidents uh, with the Black Hawk airplane that was shot down um, by its own side, okay, because of a miscommunication. On the right, you see the Korean Airlines 801 flight, and this was an issue of hierarchy. This was an issue where the co-pilots knew that the plane was going to crash because the trajectory was wrong, but they were not able to tell the pilot because of that power, power distance. You know, they were not able to, 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 to say to the pilot that we need to correct course, and they crashed, everyone dying. So my first exposure to the way that the Army communicates was, interestingly enough, um, during the Formula One races um, that were held in Malaysia not long ago. Um, I was drafted to be part of the medical team and attended the simulation uh, courses for that. And these were run actually by the army. Okay, this is General uh, Mohamed Zin, uh, who um, ran the medical services for the army and has actually written um, a text on how to operate in a battlefield. So it's not surprising that we turn to um, the army doctors when we have to handle disasters. And some of this is incorporated in the next two courses that I'm going to talk about, which are the CRISP course and the NOTS course. So CRISP course um, actually tries to teach an algorithm for initial management of uh, critically ill surgical patients. And we established this in Malaysia back in 2013. This is John Jameson. Uh, who is a consultant surgeon, and Danny Bryden, who is an anesthetist. And um, they wrote the latest edition of the uh, CRISP course. It's multimodal, and we use a combination of interactive lectures, small group sessions, and what I find is uh, gets the most um, um, impact is actually the moulage and role play. And I'm just going to play a very short <laughs> segment here. So what you see here are the faculty or the trainers, and they are simulating being called to assess a sick surgical patient. but it's not just about demonstrating yeah because uh, for us we have to do and so what you will see in this clip is a trainee trying to explain or to break bad news to a patient. Yes, sir, doctor. So 
Then appendix, doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. What else is there? There's a hole in the bowel. Hole in the bowel? No, no, no. He said, Ronnie. Yes. Doctor. So based on a real life incident, um, but obviously simulated for that particular session. So you can see that it actually allows um, not only for behaviors to be modeled, whether they're good behaviors or bad behaviors, but we can also get the trainees to comment and pick up which behaviors are good and which are bad, and then discuss uh, how it could have been done better. The NOTS courses uh, on non-technical skills for surgeons, um, we began running around 2014, and this is Simon Patterson Brown, who is a uh, consultant upper GI surgeon in the UK, uh, worked together with us to try and build um, the course in Malaysia. Uh, and it arose from the recognition that many sentinel events, in fact, most of them uh, occur as a result of non-technical factors, so human factors, leadership, communication, communication, these are the failures that result in um, uh, sentinel events. So this is the NOTS framework, and I'm not going to go into how this was derived, um, but it basically looks at four domains, which is situational awareness, decision making, communication and teamwork, as well as leadership. And uh, we then train participants to understand what these are and how to recognize it. And we also provide trainers with uh, uh, an algorithm or uh, rubrics for you to assess this in your trainings. And this has been shown to be reliable as well as usable, both as an assessment tool, but as a training method as well. Okay, so it's quite a nice course to take because it doesn't uh, require much in the way of equipment. And we've taken it as far afield as uh, Sabah and, and Sarawak. Um, and I just want to show you a short clip uh, caveat here or disclaimer here is this is all acting, okay? It is not how we actually behave in the theatre, she says. Basically, what we're doing here is we get the participants don't to push watch. Up, don't push up the and you can actually turn this many ways. You can ask them to evaluate the surgeon. You can ask them to evaluate the assistant okay. or the anaesthetist. And you can ask them Just to actually the evaluate steady. based on I'm one of those domains. Here. So Sorry, was the leadership of okay. the surgeon in this situation, was it acceptable? Uh, was the communication acceptable? What about the assistant? Was the assistant uh, being a team player in this situation. So there are many ways that we can frame this, even just using the same scenario. 
So if you were evaluating them, the research and on decision making, it might have been different. You know, it might have been acceptable at the end. Um, however, if you're talking about teamwork and communication, the surgeon would be, be actually marked down. All right. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the role of trainers. And a surgical trainer actually has many four roles. You know, it covers the clinical, the research aspects, the educational aspects. You've got to be savvy with administrative requirements, and also you need to be able to mentor your trainees. And this is one person expected to do everything. If you look at sports, that's not the case because usually each of these different roles is assigned to a different person and the head coach or the manager just coordinates all these activities. And I think that's something that we have to seriously look at doing uh, for surgical training. You cannot expect one person to be able to be all things uh, to a trainee. And so what do we need to do in order to professionalize trainers? Well, first we need to identify the needs of the trainees. We need to set the standards and it should not be a case of lowering the standards just to please um, your stakeholders. Uh, we need to be able to train trainers to give constructive feedback. Um, and then for the program itself, we need to structure it well, make sure it's relevant content and that the delivery is appropriate. So again, all these things that need to be fulfilled by a trainer, not easy to do. And if you get it wrong, well, if you get it right, you might get a trainer who's wise, has the experience of years, and knows just how to manage uh, a difficult trainee. You could get a trainer who is, you know, has a good heart, wants to do the right thing, but it's maybe a little lacking in experience and will make mistakes along the way, and then eventually might gain the wisdom and then become a good trainer. And you can get those that really have no business being in training and will lead you to a dark and worrisome path. So how are we going to do this? Well, at UM, um, we certainly have training the trainers at undergraduate level. And this is something that um, I've been in discussions with to try and work out something that is at a higher level for uh, surgical trainers. But um, in a more modular form, we certainly do training the trainers for our various courses. So this is a CRISP instructor's course, um, and uh, it, it covers many of the uh, similar aspects of the undergraduate um, course, but pitched at a higher level. We also need to professionalize examinations, and I think we do very well at undergraduate level, but postgraduate examinations are a much more tricky thing uh, to uh, achieve. And what you will see here is the um, number of personnel that's required to organize a clinical exam. Uh, it's, it's a big, big undertaking, and it involves moving patients around and making sure you've got an appropriate venue. And I think this is something that if the faculty or the, the country wants to enter into in a more meaningful way, we do need to have a formalized secretariat to organize this. I don't think it should be just the day job of a practicing active surgeon to organize these examinations. What about the examiners themselves? Uh, well, examiner training is something that we now routinely do. And this uh, examiner training course, which I do with Prof. Alizan and Prof. Tambidore, uh, is, is something that we were helped along with by Professor David Galloway, um, who's the past president of the Glasgow College. And I'm just going to show you a short clip. I see Osama's in the audience, so he will really recognize this. It's not you. It's really, really bad. You know, I had a candidate, I remember from the last exam, he's a very bad candidate, very poor candidate. You know, he's given a lot of problems. What I heard from the supervisor as well, uh, even during the training, was a difficult uh, uh, training as well, never turned up to work, you know, very stroppy, caused a lot of discipline problems. Exactly. And then the last exam, I remember, I'll never forget the guy. You know, he, uh, he can't even define what is uh, basic suture. He didn't even know the fundamentals of uh, basic suture. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Um, I remember his name, but I'll never forget when I asked his name. Very, 
be uh, some mean by the name of uh, Kamaraja Ningam. Kamaraja? Oh, I'm not about him. Oh, <laughs> Apologies uh, to Kamaraja. Uh, <laughs> acting, okay, acting. Yeah. You know what? So basically what this was supposed to show is unacceptable behaviours because um, trainees are supposed to be ex assessed in examinations based on their performance in the examination. They should not have their performance uh, uh, biased by prior um, uh, performances. And so that's a point that we were trying to get across um, in this video. And we've got a few other videos as well that we... Um, try to illustrate less than desirable examiner behaviors. It's always very popular. Um, yeah. Okay. But basically, with a high pressure, high stakes environment in, in surgical workplaces, uh, there is the risk of oppressive behaviors being um, cultivated and having a toxic uh, work culture. Uh, this was some work I did with Professor Serena Lowe and uh, Antonia, who was her postdoc. Uh, and it was basically to try and see if there really was a problem with discrimination, bullying, sexual harassment and harassment among surgical trainees. And, and while I hoped that I would be proven wrong, unfortunately, you can see that the incidence of bullying is more than 60%. Okay. Uh, and in, in women, sexual harassment, nearly 20%. This is not acceptable in a field that you know, we consider as a, as a profession, as uh, supposedly um, an example to, to the rest of society. Uh, it's even worse if you ask them, have they observed such behaviors being done to others? And that number goes up to 85%. Okay. So we've got a lot of work um, within the fraternity to try and address this. Um, and it starts with holding people accountable. And this is something that, again, from sports, we have learnt uh, to do. Um, on the left, you'll see Larry Nasa, who was actually uh, the um, doctor uh, who was in charge of the US gymnastics team. And basically, he had been systematically abusing his charges for years for years um, until only recently when he was brought to court and found guilty. Okay, And if you think it's not on our shores in the surgical fraternity, well, we've already had a case. And again, years before it was actually um, uh, brought to bear. But part of it is, I think, that there is a lack of awareness. And so through activities with uh, surgical professional bodies, but also the legal fraternity here, um, and by working within our own institutions to provide support services like counselling, uh, you know, awareness of uh, avenues for redress, I think we can make a good start there. And we need to do this because such oppressive behaviour, such toxic work environments will lead or will exacerbate issues of burnout. Okay, What is burnout? Well, it's the collapse of physical mental and a quality of life um, uh, within a person. And these physical effects, because of the long work hours, because of the demands, you know, will lead not only to neglect of your own health, but in fact, it actually is detrimental to patients because you're less likely to recommend um, preventative measures in your patients if you're ill yourself. And the mental effects are significant. Depression, suicide, substance abuse, divorce, all of these are higher in surgeons as compared to other uh, medical specialties. Um, so I think we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves and our fraternity uh, to see what we can do about it. If we don't, well, the impact, as I've shown you, um, is, is great. But it also may actually lead to a lower life expectancy among surgeons. And this was work that was done in Taiwan that shows that surgeons are more likely to die young. Okay? And we have had, I know you all know the surgeons in the audience, we, you know we have lost many excellent surgeons at a much younger age than the expected um, in this country. Okay? And it's worse in low resource centers. Um, and that's why Ministry of Health really needs to look into why um, they are sending people to be sole surgeons in isolated areas to deal with 
difficult issues. And if you're not worried about the surgeons themselves and you think, well, you know, we're expendable, well, I'm going to tell you that burnout has an impact on patient safety as well. Okay, so we need to address this. So what can we learn from the army, perhaps? The tour of duty concept. So you send someone to an uh, area of conflict, you know, they go there for a tour of duty six weeks or six months or whatever. They come back, they get time off. And I think we need to look at that. What about physical conditioning? I recently surveyed our senior um, surgical trainees, and 65% of them had gained weight by the end of their um, training program. And the average gain, it's not small, it's, it's five kilos. The, the largest one was, I think, about 12 kilos in three and a half years. Um, we now put our patients through rigorous physical fitness testing before they undergo complex surgeries. We don't put ourselves through rigorous physical fitness testing before we perform a 10 hour or 15 hour operation and I'm not sure why we should. Okay, so this is my idea that maybe we should start doing this and I'm working with uh, Prof Naha from Sports Medicine. And we hope to actually start doing this with the, the next intake into, into the surgical training program. So this is CPET testing. So basically the, the, the uh, trainee is put through increasing levels of uh, exertion and his heart rate as well as his VO2 max is uh, monitored. And then it's matched against what would be expected for a fit person um, in your age group. Um, and, and sad to say, very sorry Vincent, but you didn't meet the minimum. But it shows that we need to really take this seriously, you know, because we don't want to have surgeons keeling over while they're uh, performing surgeries. Okay, so I've put this diagram here just to say that um, the physical peak is actually at around 28 years. And that's why for professional athletes, you have to start so early because that's, what, that's the peak that you want to hit. You know, so how is it that the surgical peak is around 45 to 50 years? Why isn't it 28 as well? Because we do a lot of um, physical um, activities also. Um, and this is where experience actually comes into play and allows you to compensate for any uh, shortfall in your uh, physical um, competence. Okay, but clearly there will come a time where the compensation is insufficient. And so we need to look at testing of senior surgeons as well to see whether you can still perform cognitively as well as from a psychomotor aspect. And I think that's coming. To make all these changes is not going to be easy. And if you look the world over, there are many sayings that essentially say, we're better if we work together. Okay, and I have been privileged in my journey to work with some exemplary surgeons um, together on the conjoint board as well as on the college. Uh, and to restructure the training, we've been working for the past six years already now on the national curriculum project. And I think we're almost there actually for the um, advanced training, which is, which is the master's program. But we're now starting to focus on basic surgical training because as I've said, we need to start earlier and we need to train more efficiently. So later this month, we're going to be launching um, the e-training platform um, in the Academy of Medicine, which is going to be both a registration assessment as well as feedback platform. Um, and we're going to be briefing trainers and trainees on how to use this. As part of the basic surgical training curriculum, there has to be some sort of a um, exit um, examination. And so we're going to use the same examination that is pre-entrance uh, for the masters, which is the medex exam. Okay, and we've already started um, producing some resources uh, for the trainees. And I hope, I hope that in future, we no longer have to train for 26 years and that by being 
more effective in our training methods, we can cut it down to 15 years. Still a long time, but remember that you're dealing with patients' lives here, so I don't think we can just give you a paper certificate after a year. Okay? Which brings me, finally, they say, to the last uh, few slides. And um, this is actually to illustrate something from Shakespeare's As You Like It, where he talks about the seven ages of man. Um, we like to think that we'll always be here at our peak, at our prime, performing exceptionally well. But the reality is that there is going to be a slow decline. And what do we do? Do we just cast aside the surgeons who have spent 20, 30 years training to be able to do what they do? Or do we think that there can be some value in the wisdom that they have acquired over the years? So again, looking at sports, and I have to clarify here, I'm not a David Beckham fan. Wrong team. Um, but, but I think what he's done incredibly well is he's learned to develop his personal brand. He's learned to diversify even before um, he came towards uh, retirement age. And I think he's managed to leverage whatever his personal brand is into um, his second and third careers. And that's something that we can um, learn from him. Uh, in Malaysia, we have, of course, uh, Tan Sri Manijega Faison. So he was exceptional in that he was uh, um, an athlete, the fastest man in Malaysia, I think, at the time. Uh, but he was also a medical doctor. And again, he's managed to leverage his, his fame as an athlete into um, leadership uh, roles um, in, in medicine. And so I believe he was deputy DG at one time uh, in Malaysia. And of course, um, I have to mention my friend, uh, Farahani, who is, of course, an international level rhythmic gymnast and is now actually a plastic surgeon um, in UKM. So again, she's managed to balance that performance at very high levels in, in athletics, uh, but still managing to find the time to qualify uh, as a surgeon. So to my trainees, what's your excuse? What other strategies can we learn? And this is after Collier. Um, I think we need to recognize the physical decline, the cognitive decline, and there should be phased withdrawal of, of clinical activities where you reduce the volume, reduce the complexity of the surgeries that are being done. Um, I know this is unpopular when there are limited human resources, but I think senior surgeons need to come off the call roster uh, because you're not going to be performing optimally if you're... Uh, not able to uh, get enough sleep and rest um, between um, cases. Uh, and we need to already start thinking, even 10 years before retirement, you need to start thinking about alternate career options. You know, whether it would be going into administration, uh, going to predominantly teaching, research, or coaching, um, or whether you're going to use the expertise you have gained over many years to assist in medical legal consultancies. I think that's that's something that you need to start thinking well ahead of time. So in summary, surgical training is arduous and long, but ultimately for us, for those of us who love what we do, it's, it's really rewarding. The training that we do must be purpose fit. What we do here in Malaysia is going to be different from what you do in the UK. It's going to be different from what you do in Africa. Um, yes, we want to shorten the training, but it cannot be at the expense of compromised standards. And so perhaps we should be starting earlier to train uh, and to train more effectively to maximize the productive years left. To do this, we need creative solutions um, so that the standards are maintained while minimizing burnout, not just for trainees, but for trainers as well. And I would say that the trainers' burnout levels are probably higher than the trainees in some respects. We need to also emphasize the surgical professionalism aspects of a patient-centered approach uh, while still maintaining the technical excellence that we are known for, as well as the non-technical skills. And I think we need to recognize that throughout your surgical career, you will need to continually uh, develop in terms of your um, professional aspects. 
And this means reinvention, whether you like it or not. There's no staying in your comfort zone, unfortunately. Finally, there is a saying that it takes a village to raise a child. I would say it takes a nation to raise a surgeon. But having said that, um, we cannot underestimate the importance of family. And this is my last slide, you'll be glad to know. Um, I just want to convey my deepest and utter gratitude to my family. This is mom and dad, my sisters and brother. Um, mom and dad in particular, you know, have really been my bedrock uh, through all the difficult times in the past years. They were the ones who, you know, took on the role of babysitters when I would be gone for 36 hours at a time or even weeks at a time um, during my cardiothoracic posting. Um, but they were there for me and uh, I'm very, very grateful. My in-laws as well stepped up to the plate um, and again, when I had to travel, they came traveling with me so that I could bring my, my children with me. So a big shout out to them and thank you very much. And finally, Aslan, I know 35 years ago, you probably didn't realize, you know, the journey that we were going to embark upon, um, but we're here now and uh, you've kept your promise never to tell me what to do. And you've supported me through thick and thin. And for that, thank you very, very much. Right, thank you. Thank you for the uh, interesting uh, lecture, Professor Dr. April Samuel Roslani. Uh, distinguished guests, um, I would like to call upon uh, Professor uh, Dr. Dr. Adiba Kamaruzaman to conclude the lecture which has been delivered by Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani a moment ago. Professor April Kamila Roslani. Excellence is not exceptional, it is expected, is what you said your family mantra is. And obviously, you have breathed and lived it for throughout your years. And Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, that's going to be our new motto. <laughs> um, that was a wonderful journey, April, of your early years. Uh, obviously, nature and nurture has played a very, very important role in shaping you into who you are with, uh, I get very emotional at these functions. I think those of you in the faculty know this too, only too well. Um, <clears throat> having high achieving parents uh, and your early years in, in sports, in music, uh, shaped you into who you are. Your memories back into the anatomy class brought back my own memory of uh, initially starting with carving shark's heads. Uh, Monash University didn't believe in letting us loose on cadavers and made us, uh, made us um, dissect shark's heads for about three months. Um, and your tribute to those who came before you and inspired you was also um, very, very touching. I think for those of you who are not involved in medical education, April has beautifully uh, described the changes that have occurred in the last few decades in terms of medical education, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. It's no longer see one, do one, teach one, which um, probably you had a little bit of that. I certainly had most of that, and many in the audience who Warga uh, Amas um, would have uh, had that kind of training. But medical and uh, postgraduate medical education training has uh, really gone uh, under 
tremendous changes for the better, I would say, um, and is much more structured, much more professional, um, and with a lot of science behind it um, that can only, I think, improve um, the kinds of doctors and surgeons that we produce in the um, future. This faculty prides itself in having uh, clinicians who play all those four roles that we expect uh, an academic clinician to play. They heal, they teach, they do research, although some people grumble for that one, and um, they, they serve the community in all uh, its, its um, you know, in, in all the different areas that we are able to, to play our role in the community. We're not doctors who sit in the ivory towers. Doctors at, at um, <clears throat> Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, by and large, are not doctors who just sit in the ivory tower and um, pontificate. And you see that, you saw that this afternoon in all those roles that April played um, as a healer and in her passionate uh, role as a teacher of future surgeons, and this is actually very rare. Um, you know, uh, it's because it takes up a lot of time. I think most surgeons just want to. I'm, I'm generalizing. I'm stereotyping here. Forgive me, but many surgeons just want to be in that room, in that that operating theater, and just cut, cut, and so. But and so it's it's rather rare to find uh, a surgeon who's um, very very passionate about teaching, and um, we all uh, uh, can only uh, be thankful to April and her team for taking on this role. So the journey that started off uh, as a child doing ballet uh, is now. Uh, employing modern uh, teaching uh, methods, uh, not just in the conventional teaching methods, but actually leading the world in some of the uh, things that you saw together with uh, Vicky and others using virtual reality uh, to train surgeons in the post-COVID era. So that, that's a um, pretty exciting development. And so, um, in my final words, uh, with April leading many, many of the surgical training initiatives, including um, the one that's very close to my heart, the National Postgraduate Training Curriculum, that I promise you we will deliver by next year, the future of surgical training in this country, as you can see, uh, pardon the pun, is in very good hands. So, April, thank you very much for a fantastic uh, lecture. Thank you, Professor Dato, uh, Dr. Adiba, for uh, chairing this lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, the management of the Faculty of Medicine, International Corporate Relations Office, uh, citizens of University of Malaya, as well as all the guests in here uh, for your time. With this, uh, we have reached the end of the lecture. On behalf of the University of Malaya, I would like to apologize if there had been any weakness from our side uh, in organizing this lecture. With that, I thank you, and the ceremony has ended. Thank you. Can I get the uh, guests on my right and also uh, on my uh, and on my left uh, to go uh, to uh, to leave the auditorium uh, as per SOP uh, from row to row, and um, the guests in the centre uh, not to leave the auditorium just yet because we have uh, some photo shoots uh, um, to be attend. Very nice, very nice. Nice lecture.